Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee from the Skill Builder channel. If you've never been here before, this is a channel that talks about all things building, hopefully from a theoretical and also a practical point of view. So in this video, I want to talk about racks. Now, a few weeks ago, hardly anybody outside the building industry had heard of rack reinforced aerated autoclave concrete but what does that mean we put reinforcing bars in all kinds of things we put them in lintels we put them in floors we put them in concrete decks aerated how does that go a lot of builders will already know this product by the name of aircrete block or aerated block the same thing aerated panels basically the same stuff building blocks are used on internal skins and they got great insulation values they're very lightweight and very easy to use the downside of it is that they crack so i've actually been to the place where they're made they mix up a slurry if you like a bit of water in there and then they put some cement in they put some sand in and they put some lime in the magic thing that makes it aerated is they get aluminium filings and throw that into the mix and that has a reaction with the cement and that causes a hydrogen gas and that hydrogen gas just bubbles away beautifully and that's how you get aerated if you want a lighter weight block with more insulation value like the sort of solar blocks and things like that you put in more aluminium filings if you want a stronger block you may not put in any aluminium filings at all or you put in fewer but the idea is that you can vary the aeration and it's a very good thing in terms of insulation actually they don't get as wet as a lot of people think you know i've seen experiments where they fire water at an aerated block and it doesn't go that far through the block but it is true to say that they will hold water and when you put them on top of water they float and after a while they sink so they can absorb water so what's the advantage of making a beam from an aerated mix rather than a dense concrete mix the first thing is it's lighter so therefore it has less self weight therefore it's easier to support we're talking mainly about using these in a flat roof application by the way they can be used in pitch roofs sometimes it's a fairly rare thing but mostly it'll be flat roofs we have these planks which are two foot six hundred millimeters wide they span the whole width of the building so we got the reinforcing in we've got the aerated concrete in there is a problem with that in as much as the aerated concrete doesn't stick very well to the reinforcing bars so what they do is they cover the reinforcing bars in a latex or even a bitumen and then they pour the solution in on top and then it has a better chance of adhering to the reinforcing bar as you'll see that's quite important so we've got the slurry in there we've got the rebar in there the next thing we need to do is put it into the autoclave it's like a big pressure cooker they've got a track going through they will the, the trucks in there they close the door up and they fill the thing full of steam it accelerates the curing of the concrete because it's got so much moisture in it it gives a very even curing process and it's not like a kiln it doesn't fire at huge temperatures so when we get it out we've got this reinforced lightweight concrete it's not concrete in the way that we understand concrete which has got stones in it aggregate in it and is a, a lot more dense this is a lightweight people talk about it as aero bar you know but it's that kind of a thing and uh, we wouldn't strictly call it concrete so there are problems with this particular product there are problems with a lot of different products in the world so why we've known about these products for quite a long time i mean this stuff was invented by the swedes in the 1930s and has been used extensively throughout europe so why we've suddenly got this panic days before the kids go back to school is a mystery to a lot of people because back in 2018 in Gravesend a school roof collapsed luckily there were no children in there and the school roof collapsed on a weekend and did no real harm but triggered a warning and directives were sent around to say to people watch out for this product watch out for any signs of deterioration or collapse now this is interesting because they issued this warning but they acknowledged in the same breath that there were very few if any signs of this imminent collapse of this roof in Gravesend it just happened so quite how people are going to look out for signs if there aren't any there's a little bit baffling but anyway what happened along the way is maybe some minister woke up in the middle of the night he or she went oh my goodness and I am old enough to remember Abavan where an entire school was engulfed in a slag heap of waste coal mining product it basically got wet from a lot of rain and the whole thing just slid down the hill and engulfed the school and killed the children and also the teachers in the school and it was a terrible terrible thing to see that unfolding on our television
television screens. So you would think that the priority would be to make sure that when our children go to school, they're going to school in safe buildings, but that isn't the case. Forget the rack business for a second and just talk about asbestos because it is estimated that in the last 40 years, as many as 10,000 people, they could be teachers, they could be pupils, they could be dinner ladies, caretaking staff, whatever, but people that have come into contact with asbestos in schools have died from it. A lot of people will be shocked to hear that there is still asbestos in our schools. I heard a surveyor the other day say that our schools are riddled with asbestos. That suggests something like an infestation. This is a material that has deliberately been put in there that everybody knows is unsafe and yet it remains in our schools. This apart, we have reason for urgent action. So what's the problem with reinforced aerated autoclaved concrete? Well, it deteriorates, but we've known about problems with reinforced concrete for years. We've done a video on that very subject and all over the world there is reinforced concrete which is disintegrating before our very eyes. Now hang on that phrase for just a second because if you see conventional concrete with reinforcing bar inside it and the rebar starts to rust through water ingress or some other problem like that, maybe a salt atmosphere or something, but one way or another the moisture gets in there, gets past the sand and cement and it starts to attack the rebar and when it attacks the rebar the rebar starts to rust and as it rusts it expands and in conventional concrete you will see the face of the concrete popping off and exposing the rebar. I've seen it many, many times. Walk around and you'll see it in Spaghetti Junction, you'll see it in loads and loads of other places. There was a bridge collapse in Italy and there was a building that collapsed in Florida. And it's highly likely that in both those cases, the contributing factor was that it was rusty rebar. And the fact that you can see it is in a way a blessing because you're alerted to the problem. You can carry out remedial repairs very often, or you can do something like replacing the concrete. But when you're talking about aerated concrete, you get a leak in a flat roof and the water gets down through the concrete. Don't forget it's lovely and bubbly. So therefore it's more porous than dense concrete, but whichever way the water gets in, rusts the rebar rather than the rebar pushing the concrete out because it's expanding and that concrete has got more give in it because it's got all those lovely bubbles in it. What happens is that the rust, the expansion of the rebar is absorbed, if you like, within the concrete and you don't see any external signs of spalling. So therefore, that's the first thing that they talk about with aerated concrete is that you may have no warning. If you had a timber beam or something like that above you and it was starting to fail, starting to sag, you would hear it creaking. So let's just have a look. We've got two walls of a of a building. This could be a school, it could be a hospital, by the way. Same thing applies. It's not only schools that are a problem. And they stick a beam on the inner skin. This is a cavity wall. So we've got a block going down there. So they put a beam on and the beam goes all the way across and it sits on the two walls there on what we call the bearing. Now, the bearing should be a minimum of 75 millimeters. But for some various reasons, that doesn't always happen. Maybe there was a miscalculation. Maybe the beams were ordered. Maybe the people setting out the brickwork weren't too accurate and that drifted. So that 75 millimeters, which they put in, may come down to as little as 50 millimeters or two inches. What's the problem with two inches? Well, at two inches, you've got a what you call a shear here which is roughly like that. So that area there is very likely to snap if there's any kind of problem. I've already said that the rebar has started to deteriorate in there and that it's pushed the concrete away. So basically what you've got inside there, a bar of steel, which is no longer gripped by the concrete as it would be with dense concrete, which is still hanging on. You could call that loose. Now that rebar isn't particularly thick or particularly strong. I mean, we carry it around site and it flops around all over the place. But if it's encased in concrete and it's stiffened, in order for that beam to bend, that concrete would have to compress at this point and stretch at that point. So you get a crack there and you get a certain amount of compression there. So you can see that there isn't the rebar, but it's the concrete that is really stopping the rebar from bending. So without that, rebar is free to bend. It's free to sag. And as it sags, it pulls away from the ends here because nothing to hold it there. If the rebar isn't actually tied in properly, 
to the end beams in, in a way they put a, a rebar across it or some kind of anchor point there. If it's not tied in properly, that is even worse because you're going to get that thing not quite slipping off its bearing, but it's not supported by anything other than that tiny little rebar. Now, the photographs of the Gravesend school show that when the concrete snapped at this shear point here, that bit of rebar that was in there just bent up maybe still had a bit of concrete hanging on the end there but all it did is just bent and allowed that beam to drop down so you see the problem if you've got if you haven't got enough bearing on there if you haven't got those rebars anchored in some way you've got a problem similarly in the middle of the roof if they couldn't span it in one piece they may have hidden up here in the ceiling what some people call an RSJ or a steel beam that would have two lengths of beam sitting on it hopefully close together although that can never be assured. And those two beams are sitting on a bearing here. Now, if that beam is only 100 millimeters wide on that flange, you've only got 50 mil or two inches of bearing on each of those beams in the middle. So you could then get a very similar thing. Don't forget, here's your shear point again. You could very, very easily get a similar thing where it broke there, that bit of rebar just bent up and the whole thing collapsed, suddenly and catastrophically collapsing. So I was looking at the advice, the directive, if you like, from the Standing Committee on the Safety of Buildings, and they issued some advice notes to people that are interested, in other words, people that look after schools and hospitals and all the other things, to say to them, watch out for signs of this happening. If, for example, you see two panels side by side in the roof, I said they were about 600 millimeters wide, these panels. If you see that and you see one panel is slightly lower than the other, and we're only talking about a few millimeters, that would be an indication that one of the panels was sagging in the middle. And that could happen. You could get one panel sagging and the other one still holding perfectly rigidly, if you like, in line, because you had a leak in a roof and the leak came down and it rusted the bit of rebar in one single panel. One single panel is still a problem. In actual fact, it may be that if one panel collapses, two or three will go with it. Again, it's this problem of leaking roofs. First of all, they're asking anybody who's interested to look out for any unevenness in the panels. You may find that some kid sitting in class suddenly sees that there's an unusual crack that's appeared. So what they're suggesting is that if you have a building that has reinforced aerated autoclave concrete in it, that you get a surveyor in, and that surveyor has to be experienced with this material, which is, again, not every surveyor out there is experienced with this material. So they're going to be in demand. This small number of surveyors is going to have to go around the country, peering into roof spaces, looking, maybe drilling a hole to find what the bearing is on the end of these panels, giving it a clean bill of health. Personally, I wouldn't want that job. One thing, it's almost impossible to tell whether that panel is safe or not. But the other thing is that you've got covering. Very rarely have you got a situation, okay, the panels don't look too bad, actually. You get a little groove in between them, if you like, where you've got chamfer, but they don't look too bad. But what they very often would do is cover that with a suspended ceiling or something else, plasterboard or whatever it was, but what you would see there is a ceiling. It may even be asbestos sheeting on there, asbestos cement boarding on, on the underside of there. But that surveyor has got to look at that sheeting, decide whether there's been any kind of movement up there. So they need somebody to lift the tiles up, expose all those areas. And again, we come up against this problem of asbestos. And then the surveyor's got to sign that building off as being safe. And I think that is a very, very difficult thing for any surveyor to do. Interestingly, Neil Gray, who is some kind of Scottish MP who has been given a brief, he has said in Scottish Parliament, there is no imminent danger from rack in Scotland. Well, that is a hell of a thing to say. He's not a surveyor. He's got advice from somebody, obviously, and they've told him that there isn't any imminent danger in Scotland, which I find to be completely baffling. Because if you think about that, in essence, you're talking about the border between England and Scotland. What he is saying, Neil Gray, anything on that side of the borderline is not going to collapse. Anything on that side of the borderline can collapse. Are they saying that it's a superior product that they've got in Scotland, or maybe it's not as old? I really don't understand that statement, and I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't U-turn on it in the very near future, because that is a hell of an undertaking 
working. And if I had children in Scotland, if I was sending them to school, then I would be very, very wary. I would not trust the utterances of a politician because we've all been there, we've all seen them make promises and then suddenly what they say yesterday is no longer the case. So the obvious answer here is to treat all buildings with rack, whether they be hospitals or schools, as suspect and take urgent action to mitigate the problem. And what would be urgent action? Well, what you could do very easily and very quickly is you could put planks along there if you like, bits of timber along there, and you could put what we call acros. Now they are steel props used by builders. If you've ever had a, an extension done and they've knocked through and they've put a steel beam in there, they're used all the time. And what they would do is they would put acros all the way around the perimeter of the building, maybe one on every single one of these planks. And also if they had a join in the middle, they would have to put a couple of acros there. So the kids would have to get very, very used to dancing around the acros. And if you're in the acro hire business, look out for a boom. But of course, another bit of nonsense is that they could hire those acros and put them in, but they could just as easily buy them. And if they're gonna sit there for six months, those acros would have been paid for 10 times over in the hire fee. But who knows what politician's spouse has shares in an acro hire company. It's as nicely as the kids may wrap ribbons around the acros and try and make them look a little bit more friendly. It's not a long-term solution. And that sometimes those roofs are gonna to have to be taken off preferably in the school holidays, and new roofs put on. And while we're at it, they're gonna get rid of all the asbestos as well. And if you look at the state of some of these schools, you may think, okay, they were built in the 60s, 70s. They weren't particularly high quality schools. Let's tear them down and build new ones. And of course, the Labour government had a policy when they were in power and they said, we're gonna build schools for the future. And then Michael Gove came in under the Tories and he said, you know what, I think we'll shelve that. It's too expensive, we can't do it. But I would say that let's forget about building schools for the future, let's talk about building them for now. And and hopefully they will have enough quality in them to last for a long time. Now this in itself is a thorny issue and I offer this up really for discussion from people. I'd be very interested to know what you think but I've traveled in a few countries where you see a standard school design. For example in Thailand all the schools they all follow exactly the same pattern. Now I know that that doesn't do much for architectural diversity but the advantage of it is that those buildings have been tried and tested. You don't get an architect out for every single school you build to design something, go through that hugely expensive process and then have the thing put through building control and approve. What you do is you have a standard proven design for schools. You get involved, the teachers, the pupils, the architect, the engineers and everybody. You build a school which is fit for purpose, which is accessible to people in wheelchairs and all the other things that we need to do and maybe even for blind people to walk around and they'd be familiar with that particular layout. So so there's all kinds of advantages in having a standard design for a school building. It happens in other parts of the world. If you look at something like the design of the American school bus, for example, it's the same school bus all over the United States because it's been dropped on its roof, it's been rolled down cliffs, it's been given all kinds of rigorous tests and they know that if that bus is involved in an accident, their kids have got a better chance of surviving it. Similarly with schools in countries who have adopted this idea of a standard school design Design that's proven, then you've got a lot less expense. You can just basically say, right, we're going to build a school in that location. We don't need to go through the planning permission, the building regs approval, the architects mincing about. We just build the bloody thing. And the one thing I'm going to say right from the beginning when you're designing these new wonderful schools is do not, whatever you do, build them with flat roofs because everybody knows that flat roofs are trouble. At some point, they're going to leak. And all these problems that we see with these rack beams are caused by leaking roofs. That is where it starts and that's where it finishes. And of course, if you get a leaking roof, the other thing that they're suggesting, by the way, this Standing Committee on the Safety of Buildings, is that you should look at it, and if there's been any history of a leaking roof, and when wouldn't there be on a flat roof that's over 40 years old, then that should ring alarm bells for you. And if the roof has been recovered and they've used maybe a black bitumen material on there, that's going to attract more heat than maybe the original roof covering, which may have been silver or gray or something else. So all these factors come into it because if that roof is getting hotter, the thermal expansion and contraction and everything else is a lot 
different and what you often get in those situations when something's expanding and contracting you also get a bit of creep so it may be that this beam is physically moving along the way so that that bearing is becoming less and less and that would be another contributing factor so don't build with flat roofs build with pitch roofs and i'd like to leave you with one final thought the oldest unreinforced concrete roof in the world is on the pantheon in rome it's not a flat roof because it doesn't need to be a flat roof because it's intrinsically structurally sound because it's a dome and those domes have been used by the eskimos to build igloos have been used by countless people around the world for thousands of years and that building in rome 2000 years old and i've been in that building and i've looked up at that roof in awe i had the confidence to take my children into a building that was 2000 years old would I have the same confidence to send them into a school building in Britain that is 40 years old? Sadly, I have to say no. What did the Romans ever do for us?